Welcome uh, to our 2021 European Conference. It's great to see so many of you. We have 200 participants so far and the number is just growing by the second. Um, so I'll introduce briefly myself and Adam. Uh, we have uh, decided to organize this conference and we wanted to connect a lot of you also because you know, we are not able to meet in person and uh, all of, a lot of the conference have been canceled or have been moved online and it's not really the same uh, as, as a face-to-face -face interaction. So this one is as close as it could get. So Adam is our International Partnership and Marketing Manager here at Doc City. For those of you who don't know Doc City, I'll give you just a very brief two seconds introduction. And then there's myself, uh, who I'm the commercial director here at Doxity. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So just very brief introduction to Doxity to kind of like explain you who we are and what we do. We were founded in 2011 here in Turin in Italy. We are an Italian company. And we're today the largest student community in the world. So we're not a portal, we're not an agent, we're not an agency, we're a full on student community. We engage with students. And what we did is we created an ecosystem for students to, uh, share study material with each other and guide them through their studies. In 2014-15, we decided to expand and also help them find future educational choices. You know, at the end, they come to us looking for counseling, looking for assistance, so why not also guiding them to finding the right degree? Just a few numbers in terms of our community. We have over 20 million students connected today, and a big thanks to that is, unfortunately, in a way, because of COVID, a lot more students have been connected online, and so our traffic increased by, by almost 400%. In, uh, we're present in 70 different countries, so we have a very big presence uh, in Europe and the Americas. And, uh, you know, we're growing by 500,000 new users each month. So a lot of students are online today. Uh, that's, that's definitely a fact. So I'll let Adam give you an idea of the agenda of the day, and then uh, we can start with the first speakers. Thank you, Andrea. And I see right now, five minutes into the event, we have 245 participants. So thank you, everyone, for coming. This is incredible turnout. Uh, the plan for today is very simple. It's going to be a one hour event, an hour and a half, maybe, if you have a lot of questions. And we'll begin with opening remarks from Amy Baker. Amy is CEO and co-founder of The Pi. Uh, then we have Vincenzo from La Conferenza del Colleghi uh, Universitari di Merito, um, an association here in Italy. Then we have Pieter, who is president of the Association of Universities in the Netherlands. And then we have Bodo, uh, who is chair of the Association of AMBA, the, and he's also chair of BGA, the Business Graduate Association. And he's also a professor and chair of the Institute for International Marketing at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. Then we're going to have a keynote speech from George T.C. Post. George is a global higher education strategy and digitalization expert. And then we have a rapid fire talk section, a very good part of the event. And uh, for this, we're going to have Tanya, uh, who is from SOAS. We're going to have Thomas from University West. We'll have David from the University of Gibraltar. And we will have Petter from the University of Petch. And then to end things, we're going to have a keynote speech. Uh, last but not least, we will have Adonis, who is founder and president of Z Zurich Elite Business School. And then we have an audience Q&A. So in this section, it's very interactive. Uh, you can ask questions of me and Andrea and also of any speakers who are still in the event. Great, so to begin, um, Amy uh, from the Pi, I will let you um, speak. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Welcome everyone. And it's really nice to be here. And hopefully meet a few, come across a few people who I haven't engaged with, but we are, the Pi is a B2B platform primarily, so we write for professionals working in international education, and our focus is on international students, and we know international students have had a very difficult time, as all students have, trying to engage with their peers and continue their studies, often in quite challenging situations with intermittent broadband. Um, I just thought I'd give you a few thoughts from our perspective. We cover global education and we have seen a few key trends in the last 12 to 18 months, one of which, of course, is around online learning and what works and what doesn't. And I think um, what we have realised is asynchronous learning does not always work with difficult, difficult time zones, but a lot of institutions have worked very hard to enable um, peer engagement of their students to 
offer WeWork, for example, ASU did a really interesting collaboration with WeWork so students could go and work at WeWork offices so they could find some sort of peer engagement. We've also seen this happening in China. So a lot of Chinese students who were due to be going to Australia or New Zealand and who were unable to enter Australia and New Zealand were able to go to different campuses within China, partner campuses of these Australian and New Zealand institutions so that they could work on campus in a cohort of fellow students. And I think that's, I think the key trend I thought I would speak about today is the need for peer engagement and peer referral, which of course is very relevant given we are being hosted by Doc City. Um, but in terms of other trends, as well as how to study and succeed and thrive in on an online environment, the other thing we have seen is the rise of recruitment um, cohesive and investment-led recruitment strategies for students. Um, but the one, some of the models we've seen really flourish in the last 12 to 18 months have been all around peer referrals and peer recruitment. So we have the Access Platform, we have Unibuddy. These are two businesses which enable students who are yet to embark on their journey to engage with students who might be interested in the same discipline or they might be from the same country. But they are enabling students to reach out and connect and ask questions of their fellow students who have already taken that journey before them. And that we've seen huge power around the, the bonus and benefit of peer referral. And especially given the current situation when traditionally universities have traveled to India or traveled to Brazil and tried to meet at student fairs and all of that has been impossible. So those peer referral apps have become uh, vital and a really useful recruitment tool for the institutions. Um, Peer engagement, not just at recruitment level, but while you are in situ is another big trend we are seeing. There's a really interesting company called Vigo, based out of Australia, which you might not have come across, but Vigo launched something called the Mentor Academy this year with 12 key institutions on board. And that is the idea that you can find a champion among your student, your fellow student cohort, a champion who will help you, guide you through your journey and help support you a bit like a guardian angel, but a student guardian angel who's already in your institution. And that is an app which is being rolled out quite successfully and fairly extensively in Australia and will be coming your way soon, I think. So I thought I would just give you a few of yeah, the, the viewpoints we have had, peer, peer referral, peer engagement. The idea of trying to foster a student community has become more prevalent than ever really in a situation when it's been harder than ever to foster that student community and that student engagement. And the other thing we have really noticed at the Pi is the technologization of student recruitment. Now, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but just to share my perspectives on that, there's been a huge amount of funding, 170 million Canadian dollars just into Apply Board alone. That's one of the big platforms that everyone is familiar with, but we have the Times Higher now trying to recruit students via its rankings website and take them through a journey. And now we have QS, which has already always, won, always run student fairs and events. They have announced a partnership with SI UK, trying to enable students coming to their ranking site to now have a counseling process and a journey. So I think there's gonna be a lot more choice actually, and there's gonna be even more decisions for students to navigate. There are lots of apps now which give you predictive outcomes on your likelihood of being accepted based on your um, previous um, academic record. So there's, a lot of technology and a lot of apps and a lot more choice actually and a lot more competition actually in terms of a business perspective in terms of how to recruit students but i think i think one of the really good outcomes in, in this evolving marketplace is that peer referral and peer engagement are still front and center and there are still lots of opportunities for students to engage with their peers as they make a very expensive and hopefully very important journey in their higher education career Okay, thank you very much, Amy. Um, very good insights. Um, so now uh, we can hear from Vincenzo, who is from the CCUM in Italy. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure for me to provide my contribution to the first uh, uh, conference of the European universities. Uh, a special thanks uh, to, to Adam and to Andrea for inviting me. And uh, I'm representing the network of uh, 52 uh, Merit College in Italy. Uh, the network of uh, Collegio Universitario di Merito pools um, higher educational institution, which provides university students uh, with uh, extracurricular activities, uh, 
focusing mainly on soft skills uh, like uh, public speaking, uh, problem solving, uh, uh, language learning, uh, and these uh, would provide them, uh, in addition to the classes that they attend uh, at the university, uh, with additional assets that become uh, very profitable when they enter uh, the job market. Bear in mind that vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, 50% of graduate students that uh, uh, got their degree from Italian university uh, over the year, 90% uh, of students uh, which got their degree having attended the university college, uh, they find their occupation uh, within three months from the moment that they get the uh, valuable uh, profile uh, in front of uh, the job market. We also promote uh, uh, international mobility. We host the university students from abroad and we encourage our students to spend a period of time abroad. The one you can see at my shoulder is uh, the picture of one of the premises. They are very fascinating buildings. Uh, uh, most of them are historical monument. The one at my back is based in Pavia, it is 40, 60 year, 460 years old. Uh, we have cooperation agreement uh, with uh, uh, other colleges around the Europe. Uh, for instance, uh, we have signed a cooperation agreement uh, with Colegios Mayores de España uh, a couple of years uh, ago. And uh, on a bilateral level, uh, we have a cooperation agreement uh, with the college uh, spread all over Europe, for instance, uh, between Pavia and the Corpus Christi and other colleges in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, we have a preferential agreement for uh, uh, exchange of students. What is important is that we host mainly undergraduate, but also postgraduate students. We, um, we have grants and bursaries in order to allow talented students uh, to join the college uh, irrespective of the income of their family. And uh, we also have uh, a network of uh, alumni. Uh, we currently host uh, 4,500 students in our 52 college all over Italy, but we have uh, thousands and thousands of alumni around the world uh, in a very distinguished uh, position uh, in, a, uh, in, in public and private uh, uh, companies or uh, entities. And uh, these represent uh, uh, a way to encourage international relationship and to facilitate access uh, to, uh, the, uh, to the job market. Uh, I don't want it to, um, to go beyond the time limit that I've been assigned, but uh, if you want to go more on uh, our activity, you can have a look at our institutional websites, www.collegiuniversitari.it, and I myself would be delighted to provide you with any additional information uh, that you may need uh, to, uh, to get uh, with regard to the way uh, our colleges are organized and how they concur to promote uh, the academic system in Italy. Thank you so much. Okay, grazie Vincenzo. Uh, pleasure to hear that. Um, and now we'll hear from uh, Pieter, who is from the Association of Universities in the Netherlands. Does it work? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, because the host needed to... Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, not Pieter, but it's Peter. It's the Dutch uh, version with IE, but I know it's, uh, it's difficult to pronounce or it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not a very international name, but it's like Peter in English, but then uh, with IE uh, as written in, in Dutch. Um, I'm president of the Association of Universities in the Netherlands. Uh, the association uh, combines uh, the 14 uh, public uh, research universities uh, in the Netherlands. Um, I think uh, overall one could say that the, the quality of, of research and education is, is at, at a high level in the Netherlands. Uh, all the universities are in the, in the top ranks uh, if, you would, uh, if you would value these, uh, the rankings of, uh, of Times Higher or, or, or Shanghai Indices, etc. Um, but speaking of, uh, of international mobility, what we believe is that uh, uh, international collaboration is, is key. Uh, it is uh, key for uh, students, of course, to learn and to learn the things that are valuable and to get experience that are valuable for them to be successful. 
uh, but it's also key if we want to solve global challenges uh, together. Uh, and that's why the Dutch universities are quite active in terms of, uh, of having an international agenda. Our education model is, uh, uh, is very much uh, student-centered. Uh, so there's uh, in, in the education models of the different universities, there's a lot of focus on, uh, on small, uh, 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 small groups and, uh, and tutor, uh, tutor groups. Uh, and uh, the, the, the ratings also from, uh, from students who have been through uh, education in the Netherlands for either short programs or, or longer programs are, are very high. Now, finally, a few words about the COVID uh, period, because that's also very relevant at this moment, is that uh, over the past year, so uh, the, the, the COVID crisis, let's say it started in March 2020, uh, the past year and, and already at the beginning of the crisis, uh, we've been able in the Netherlands with all the universities to switch to uh, an, a mostly online education, partially also physical. The last few months, it has there, the lockdowns were intensified, so we had to do most of it online. Uh, but actually, the education was about 90 to 95 uh, percent possible to provide that online. So even in crisis situation it was possible to scale back and, and make it online and make it uh, interactive at the same time. The study progress also in this COVID period is, uh, is quite good, uh, which is not to say that it is uh, nicer because everybody wants to go back to the campus. And, uh, and so that's why uh, even though the, the study progress is good, everything is provided. There are like, like this Zoom call, there are interactive classes. Uh, but we are very much focusing now on, um, on scaling up a physical education uh, again. Uh, we hope to make a few steps over the next uh, few months to, to further scale up. And uh, what we hope is that in, in September that we will have much more also, again, campus education. So most universities in the Netherlands are now also saying to international uh, students who are interested, to say, please, uh, when you look at the Netherlands, uh, make sure that you, that you think about actually moving to the place. And we are doing our utmost best uh, here to make sure that can work. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate your words. And finally, last but not least, uh, we have Bodo, who is um, from AMBA, the BGA and the Vienna University of Economics and Business. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. I very much appreciate that. Um, I know that I have been giving a brief which uh, is uh, two to two minutes and uh, 15 seconds, and that's a tall order. So I'm, I'm trying to be relatively brief. So what I want to do is I want to talk about three subjects. First of all, who we are in terms of AMBA and BTA and what we do. Secondly, um, or thirdly already, um, why I think business schools are changing so much and why this is uh, relevant for students. So first of all, what is AMBA? Uh, AMBA is standing for the Association of MBAs. Um, and uh, essentially, it's one of the three big accreditation agencies. The other two obviously being EFMD with their Equus accreditation and AACSB in the United States. Uh, we are organized as a charity and accredit some 280 universities around the world, uh, exactly in 75 countries. Uh, about 100 of these universities are the so-called, uh, in the group of so-called triple crown accreditation universities, meaning they are accredited by AMBA, EFMD, and AACSB altogether. The second brand is the BGA brand. BGA stands for Business Graduate Association. This is not a program accreditation, but a university accreditation, which is slightly different in focus because we focus on sustainability, on lifelong learning and on entrepreneurship. And also um, we are engaging in capacity building. For example, we organize in various regions such as Latin America, China, uh, and also in Africa, Middle East, um, capacity building workshops for business schools. Now, uh, finally, why I think uh, this uh, conference is at a very, very interesting time and comes at an interesting time. And uh, Peter has already uh, alerted to COVID and I would like to reiterate that because it has, COVID has changed 
or rather accelerated quite a number of trends we have seen in as far as that we have now a very different competitive environment um, essentially uh, a lot of geographical boundaries have been called into question suddenly you have schools from the united states competing in latin america and uh, chinese schools competing in london etc so quite a different landscape we have different technology landscape in as far as the business schools not only uh, compete with each other but suddenly compete with the likes of linkedin and uh, coursera and uh, various other consulting companies like uh, um, McKinsey uh, and so on. And we have obviously um, also a uh, somewhat eroding uh, influence of Western business schools, or perhaps I should say more positively, knowledge is much more evenly distributed to the extent that in particular Asian business schools, notably Chinese business schools, have become much more strong uh, in terms of publications, in terms of their ability to attract students than they have ever been before. And I think that's uh, all I have time for. I see already Adam is, is uh, watching his uh, clock very carefully. So <laughs> I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. What I will do, if I may, is I put a, a link to a paper uh, into a chat, uh, which basically goes into more detail in terms of why I think business schools uh, need radical innovation. Thank you very much, and I wish you a very, very good conference. Thank you very much, Bodo. Uh, excellent uh, speech. So now we have George T. Sipos, who is a global higher education strategy and digitalite digitalization expert. Always a difficult word to say. Um, uh, George, we look forward to hearing your speech, which will be about a very interesting topic. <laughs> Good morning, Adam. Wow. <laughs> An interesting topic, right? Um, yes, I plan to talk about digitalization of the universities uh, and how that works long term, right? Um, I, um, I will share a PowerPoint, but first I would like to thank Doc City for organizing this wonderful event um, and to the distinguished uh, panel of speakers uh, that I'm joining today. Um, I, uh, I find their insights um, uh, tying in with what I want to talk in terms of digitalization, hybridization of the higher education moving forward. So uh, let me share my screen and talk a little bit about the trends and what I see coming, especially with what I think necessary to be coming in the next uh, years in terms of uh, digital and hybrid uh, recruitment of students, first and foremost. I hope, uh, can you see me now? Yes, all good. It's, just, it's like the, the famous Zoom meeting line, you know, can you see me now? Somebody, somebody has uh, uh, likened that with, um, with the old uh, medium seance sessions, uh, you know, can you see me now? Can you hear me now? We'll talk a little bit about, about uh, digitalization, hybridization, um, a few words about, uh, about myself. Um, I come from international education, but I've uh, bridged over the years uh, corporate and uh, and higher education uh, for most of my uh, for most of my uh, career. Uh, I've been in Japan for many years. I'm a Japan specialist at uh, at base, um, and I sort of uh, move in between the three three major areas or three uh, parts of the world uh, consistently between Japan, the United States, and um, and um, and Europe. Um, I am right now in St. Louis, so uh, very, very good early morning from me. It's not even six o'clock. I don't tend to wake up that, that early, but I thought I would do it for the colleagues at Dark City. Um, and I have been moving between the idea of digital and, um, and international education. And I am now uh, in the process of uh, thinking of the student experience from a perspective of comprehensive digitalization and hybridization with the idea that the campus experience that we have uh, needs to move into a direction uh, where also incorporates uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid education. I would like to start always with, with this, uh, this quote from, uh, from Clayton Christensen and Harry Eyring. I'm sure many of you know this. Uh, of course, Christensen, uh, the guru of uh, disruptive innovation uh, from Harvard University Business School. Um, and he was talking about 10, 10 years ago to Bodo's point earlier and to Amy's point uh, right about, 
about the the um, uh, digitalization of universities and Coursera and the competing platforms out there. Um, uh, you know, this has been happening. It's been coming for 10 years. Uh, um, if you remember back in uh, 2011, this is the start of, um, of the MOOCs, right? Um, uh, does anybody still remember the MOOCs? I mean, they're still around there. They, they, they work. Um, uh, but um, uh, but change uh, considered Christensen back then was inevitable, and um, and um, he was hoping that it would happen internally that 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 there will be things that will add to the university experience on this digital side uh, that will ha happen more organically than it actually happened. We had to come to 2019 to 2020 to see a lot more of the uh, digital learning or the online learning. Um, but, um, but now, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we see the 2020 uh, COVID pandemic uh, bringing about sort of forcefully at least the, the spread of LMS all over the all over the world. Um, so we're looking finally at learning management software that is helping uh, move forward. So um, just briefly, I'm sure we're all aware of why why change. Of course, there's been a rising cost of universities, and I'm looking across here. I don't always look only in North America, where we know all that U.S. universities have uh, tremendous budgets to, 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 to consider every year, but also in Europe, also in, in, uh, in Asia, uh, working very closely with Japanese universities, um, I see uh, the, the reluctance to keep adding to that, um, um, uh, to that cost uh, that in many cases, while supported by the state in Japan and by the government, is still relatively high for, uh, for students. Um, we are looking at, at extremely ossified structures that need to find a way to be nimble. I'm, I'm a believer in, in, in lean management and Kaizen, right? As somebody who's worked in Toyota corporate for years, um, a continuous improvement is, is something that, that needs to constantly be um, uh, on our minds. And if you think about the student and the student experience, you want to find ways, you know, back in, back in Toyota, we had um, a, a unit that was extremely powerful called uh, uh, Kansei design or emotional design. It was all based about the response, the emotional response and the power of the customer in terms of, uh, in terms of what, um, uh, what they need and how the company needs to adapt the product. Um, and if you think about universities having not a fully on component, because we're not buying shoes in, in universities, we are not um, uh, selling anything that can be replaced immediately. We're, we're selling, we're, we're in the business of providing long life uh, learning in effect. That's what we all want, right? Um, we still have to, to adjust certain aspects of our university to, uh, to deal with with the new reality uh, of our students demanding more, expecting more, this, uh, uh, hoping for experience that uh, fit better uh, um, their, their own expectations. So um, we talked about MOOCs, we talk about the better open global access to students worldwide. I am very invested in that, you know, as somebody who's coming from a small European country uh, and who's grew up in a dictatorship, I'm very much aware of the fact that not everybody has access to the education as we have it now, as much as we try, as much as universities try today, students from all over the world are not um, um, are not ready to go on to international uh, universities simply because they can't afford it. Um, and I see in the digital um, uh, agora, as I call it, in this digital open space, as we call it, of the internet, the possibility for a lot more students to, um, um, to engage with higher education in different ways. Um, what is the silver lining of the of the COVID? Of course, it's um, it's the fact that we needed to deal with this the models that we have. Um, uh, degrees are not all there is. There is a full on experience that we have to consider when we when we look at universities. And you know what's happened? It's very interesting. And you see it in the in in Europe. You see it in the United States. You see it in Asia. Actually, uh, you know the numbers are increasing, but only for certain universities. Enrollment is increasing, but only for certain brands. And uh, we mentioned um, earlier a little bit, uh, um, one of my distinguished uh, um, pre-speakers talked about the rankings and what the rankings are and what the rankings are. They matter and they don't matter. For many students, as we know, they matter a lot. Uh, for their families, in they matter a lot, but for others, they don't. They might not be as as, uh, as relevant. So when I look at the idea of, of um, 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 a comprehensive digitalization, I see that there is an opportunity for students to apply even to even consider thinking about applying to universities that otherwise they would have never never considered because they couldn't conceive of themselves 
being able to pay to go to London, going being able to pay to, to go to, 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 to Leiden or to other places because it's just too expensive to live there. I'm not talking tuition, I'm talking literal uh, uh, living expenses. So what do the other universities do though? Fine, big brand universities are fine. They seem to be increasing. I mean, NYU was reporting last month an increase of like 28% uh, enrollment. Uh, uh, Penn State in, in Pennsylvania is increases 33%. What do we do? Where do we go with the other universities that don't have that, uh, that brand? I believe that it is this uh, digitalization of the full on experience. Again, I'm not talking just about the learning process. The learning process can be uh, happening in different ways. But I'm talking about the possibility for students to to actually access a university in a different way. And there's many different things here that we are not going to talk about uh, in this. But think about uh, COIL and the power of COIL. COIL has been coming so strongly as part of this portfolio of learning that is international and digital. And I, I've been myself in a number of uh, advisory boards for, for the past few years, especially with uh, Japan and Europe, Japan and the United States, where we're looking at developing more courses in COIL format because that allows students who could never travel to Japan or Japanese students who could never travel to, to, to France to actually be part of common projects with, uh, with students, right? Um, in Europe in particular, of course, we, we all know about Brexit. We don't need to address that anymore. Um, but we've seen, uh, especially I think from PI and from other uh, organizations in Europe, looking at uh, ways in which um, students who normally within the EU would have gone uh, to, um, to the UK are now considering alternative, um, um, alternative um, um, places because, because of the uh, cost again of what, um, of what um, uh, the UK universities are going to be for them, right? Um, so the other factor that's very important is traditionally in Europe, you would have had a lot of degrees, a lot of bachelor's degrees that are taught in the national languages. And that's the power of European education because of course universities play multiple roles. One of them, of course, being to prepare the elite of uh, uh, the countries that, that universities are based in. The question is, however, um, um, where the, the change is happening when these universities are starting to offer a lot of degrees in English and in any other uh, uh, international language. Of course, there's degrees offered in French, there's degrees offered in, in German, in non-German, non-French speaking countries. So we see a lot more of that happening. As a matter of fact, the landscape of English degrees, English language degrees, EMIs in Europe is increasingly uh, complicated. And the, the type of degrees that are being offered is it's not just the, the, the typical uh, uh, business and IT and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, the, United, the, the European Union is known for, for having affordable tuition compared to other uh, UK, US, uh, Australian universities. So what we see now, funnily enough, after we've seen so much of this movement uh, towards uh, Canada, towards the United States, um, even within the EU towards the UK, um, uh, France, Germany, uh, Japan in Asia, we now see students moving from the US <laughs> into the European Union. Maybe somebody from the UK can, can tell us better uh, how their numbers of, um, of enrollments of US students uh, is, is standing right now because the last year has seen a, a significant increase of enrollments, applications and enrollments from the United States into the UK and into other uh, universities in Europe, which is a positive thing. I mean, this is where we want to get, right? Because we've been very, in Europe internationally, if we think mobility, uh, we've been looking at huge number of Chinese students for the longest time, and of course, other, other areas. But now if we can tap into these other um, uh, markets, I think that there's, this is a positive thing uh, um, for European universities as well. What is the digital university? I look at it strictly from the student um, experience. For me, that, that is what is the most relevant um, aspect. And if you look at it, you can, you can talk. I, 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 I um, uh, think you know, there are different ways to define this. Uh, some people call it integrated university or integrated digital university and so on. I call it a comprehensive digital university, um, you know, kind of borrowing from my, from my previous um, um, life as an international uh, education strategist. Um, so, um, you know, comprehensive digitalization is looking at the stages of the student life 
and how they can be digitized or hybridized. Um, there is a certain power in the idea of hybrid. You know, um, again, I will use my corporate uh, experience in, in Toyota. One of the most powerful models that Toyota could, was able to come with, come up with, was the hybrid engine. Right? We all remember the Prius and the first generation Prius and so on and so forth. Crossing, crossbreeding, and bringing things together is always an extremely powerful uh, type of experience. And this is where I think that the power of universities is moving forward. Nobody says eliminate the campus experience. Nobody says eliminate the face-to-face -face. mentorship is and will forever remain an extremely important piece. But what can we add to it? What is there that digitalization is now offering um, us to, to add into this, uh, this model, right? So when you look at the comprehensive digitalization imperative, um, you're looking at marketing. Of course, you're looking at promoting yourself in the digital in the digital space, and this is this is where um, uh, I usually bring concrete examples, concrete solutions to universities about what is the best model that that will help you. Recruitment and admissions, of course, we all know that. I'll talk a little bit about the digital portfolio of of uh, the student recruiter, uh, student management and support, extremely important counseling, um, um, and so on. Learning management, which you already do, and we some of us went to uh, classrooms, some of us went to Blackboard, some used other, other formats, other software, other LMS. Experiential learning management, still in development. There's many companies out there trying to provide solutions, but it's not quite done. Um, uh, we're still figuring out how to do labs. We're still trying to figure out how to do other uh, types of, of experiences, right? Um, uh, library access, we've all, we're already doing a lot of that. International education, how do you do digital study abroad? It's still a question. I mean, uh, my colleague, probably uh, Peter from Page will talk a little bit about their experience back then, uh, back in the summer. They did that and other universities are doing it. Universities in Africa are now collaborating and all that. The, the hubs are, are completing it. The COIL, of course, collaborative online international learning, everybody's uh, uh, familiar with it, um, is um, a tremendous way of interacting uh, internationally. Finally, um, alumni management and development, of course, very important in, in US universities and UK universities, increasingly in other European universities as well, fundraising, engagement, and so on. All these pieces, I'm saying, can be made digital or at least hybrid uh, moving forward. Um, Defining your portfolio, uh, in my mind at least, um, uh, because you're looking at this piece that's before the actual enrollment of, of the student. Uh, um, uh, when you look at the digital student, you're looking um, um, at uh, a website, you're looking at the AI chatbots, right? Uh, these are uh, in, in US, Australian universities are increasingly popping up everywhere. You know, the ability of an AI, AI chatbot to answer questions without you necessarily being there 24-7. Right. This is this is a tremendous um, uh, and exciting development, I think. And of course, they're still learning. They're still kind of clunky. You know, they're like not quite there yet. There's those little rob robots that that need to move forward, right? Um, um, what else is there? Virtual campus tours, right? I mean, from from Google Street. Remember when that started? Now we're we're able to to use software and and VR goggles to um, uh, to see the campus. Uh, prior to even ever arriving on campus. I mean, this is a tool that regardless of the pandemic can be implemented by anybody to, to, to put your campus out there so the students can experience it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Online portal presence for, for lead generation. We all do that. Most of us do that, right? We, we sign up and we put our mini site on whatever portal, I'm not gonna give names here, and uh, we're there. They generate leads, they might not generate leads. It's, it's hit or miss, depending on where you are and who you are and what your brand is, your location and so many other factors. We're not gonna talk about the actual mar marketing piece. Uh, student peer student study communities. This is uh, this is uh, this is the model of Doc City and other other companies out there. They they are the ones who come in into an already established community and say these are other offerings. These are other possibilities for you students that we work with um, to uh, to to explore uh, study abroad, to explore other universities, to explore your uh, your your future course in in. Um, uh, uh, in college education, right? Uh, social media content, um, you know, we're paying closer and closer attention to social media content. We don't have time to talk about that, but content creation is a, is a difficult um, uh, element that we need to look at as universities today. I mean, uh, it's not just a matter of Facebook and Instagram and Twitter anymore. Uh, the power of these user today 
um, I mean, the Gen Zs and the, 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 the newer, the, the younger kids, the post Gen Zs are on TikTok, right? I mean, uh, I remember trying to start a TikTok channel in my own university a, a, a couple of years ago when I was working in university in the United States. And um, it, it's, it's extremely difficult to capture an audience. Right, because the universities have a certain message. You don't just like jump around and, and talk about. Uh, um, uh, so I gave it all to the students. I said, "You do it. You know that's the best way." So so how do you utilize TikTok in 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 in, uh, in your social media content? Digital fairs and webinars, we do those. Automated communications, right? So so creating that communication model through a CRM. Um, I think that's essential now, and we most of us do it now because it's so relevant and it's so important. Customized communications, messaging, texting, calling, WhatsApping, uh, bright WeChatting, lining, uh, all these messenger systems. We're not going to talk about them uh, today. Um, a, a few examples of the digital student recruitment. I mean, it is a given now. It is a given now that your website is your best tool. It's what you put forth that will matter the most, right? So. Um, you know, I'm not going to, I'm just, I just put a few, a few uh, slides there. I mean, a few uh, websites that, that I particularly like, as you can see, um, Ghent is, uh, is, is up there. I think it's a clean, uh, very simple um, uh, website that gives the, the student uh, what they want. What you want is what you wanted to make it very simple. You want that to be accessible on your phone. You want it to be, I mean, most of the, our students now spend all their time on their phone. So how do we get them to look at our website? What do we put there? I like the fact that Ken, for instance, as, as its first thing there has a link to international students, you know, when you go to their, to their uh, English website. But look at Brown, look at Johns Hopkins in the United States. I love that type of interactive type of um, uh, uh, website because it puts a video there. It draws you into the atmosphere of the, of, the, of the campus. It forces you to jump right in and kind of like mesmerizes you because there's a little bit of a video component, which we're all mm -hmm. now extremely uh, invested in. The SEOs, of course, we've been talking about SEO and the search engine optimization. I think there are many companies there that are catering specifically to universities. There are tricks, of course, of the trade that we need to do. When it comes to CRM, of course, um, we've all used different types of HubSpot, Salesforce, Dynamics, whichever you're, you're using. Um, you know, in my experience, it doesn't really matter which one you use as long as you use it well. It could be whichever. Right. And this may be just like um, uh, um, uh, absolutely direct information for many of you. But for others, I think it's something that we're still exploring. We're still learning how, how to use professionally because these tools in particular come from sales. They come from, uh, from a different world than our world of higher education. Um, in terms of the campus virtual uh, tours, again, um, I intended to show you a little bit of that, but please do look them up yourself. There's different tools out there. Um, uh, providers like Brazen, uh, Campus Tours, EAB, Campus 360, uh, you can see, so for instance, you'll see George Washington University, if you look uh, on their website, it has a virtual tour, virtual tour gw.edu. Very, very engaging, starting from a map, going into the building, be, having the ability to listen to a narration about the building, about the campus, right? You can do now different things with that. You can have an, a chatbot relating that where you can have an actual student and they talk through the actual uh, tour. Very, very powerful uh, tour, uh, tool. And I think it will be increasingly uh, utilized. Um, VR and AR, of course, augmented reality, um, the goggles now are being developed and they're getting more and more professional in that direction so that we um, can present our campuses way before any student uh, comes in. Um, one of the uh, more um, um, uh, powerful or um, uh, relevant uh, types of tools in, in uh, uh, recruitment, of course, is the Doxity uh, model, what I call the Doxity model, having a community where you actually tap in and come in and put yourself uh, as a university in the position of interacting with millions of students who are there to share uh, study materials and so on. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Um, I will let my colleagues maybe uh, give you a little bit of a brief uh, later on about their, uh, their model. Um, but to me, um, again, coming from my corporate experience, I've always liked the, the so-called veiled marketing or the marketing that's not direct. You know, you don't, you don't necessarily need to bombard a student with 
who you are as a university. Um, uh, and it, it's always better to let them discover how you come to them through a different means. So um, uh, this type of, of, uh, of marketing to students, I think, is extremely powerful as well. We talked about chatbots. And these are some examples. Again, it's all very primitive. Uh, it's all very uh, much at the beginning of, of things. But look, I mean, just the last month, the New York Times was saying, um, uh, this, uh, this is actually from last fall, I'm sorry, uh, when, when uh, Georgia Tech and other universities implemented um, uh, chatbots for the first time. You saw there, I think, uh, Saginaw Valley State um, uh, put it, they cut to the clutter. So it allows you, in a way, to sort of go straight to that advisor, go straight to that counselor, because the chatbot is able to answer most of the general question. How much is the tuition? Do you have a scholarship? Whatever. And they learn. They're learning slowly but surely. Will they be able to replace completely a human being? Probably not, but that's not the goal. The goal is to help us as recruiters, as people who are interfacing with the students to kind of put us in a position where we can already sort of pre-qualify a student who's talking uh, with us. And this is valid not just for um, international students, but for all our students. So many of these tools apply across, right? Um, I am going to wrap things up here. Um, I will um, leave it to, uh, to my colleagues to continue this and to um, um, uh, ask for you to ask questions later on. It doesn't need to be right now so that we can give all our presenters the opportunity to go through their uh, presentations. Uh, thank you for now and uh, please uh, find me if you need me. Thanks, George. So thank you for, for what you share with us. I think it's, uh, it really paved the way from what, for what I'm about to uh, share with you guys. Um, so the most important thing, uh, you know, we're a student community. So what I wanted to share with you is a few uh, surveys that were run within our community. So I think these are probably interesting to you to see. Um, as you can see here, you can see the numbers and I will share this, uh, this with you at the end of the, of the presentation so you don't need to take notes. But basically last year, because of COVID, a lot of our clients and a lot of um, really us in general, we wanted to find out if students were still interested in studying abroad because that was a bit of a fear, you know. Do they still want to travel? Do they want to move? Are they looking to change country, city, region or not? And this is the result we got in September 2020. So actually 76% of students were still interested in studying abroad. Now they didn't tell us if it was online or on campus, which that's the next survey I'm going to share with you. We did the same survey again in February this year, which... I thought was gonna be not as good as it is. Actually, I thought it was gonna be the opposite, but actually got even better. So students are interested in studying abroad. We have a community of over 20 million students. I mean, you can see the numbers we have uh, received answer from uh, about there. And there's a lot of students who are engaged and are looking to study abroad. Now, the big question is, are they looking to study online? Are they looking to study on campus? Are they looking for blended learning? What kind of degree are they looking for? So we asked another question to them. We asked them if they would rather start online today, actually today would be September, the next most intakes, let's say, take place in September, or January on campus. Now, we asked September also because, for example, here in Italy, we're back on lockdown, a lot of European countries are on lockdown, all of world countries are on lockdown, so, you know, starting in June or May, it will definitely be online, but September could potentially maybe be on campus. So we asked a few questions, and as you can see, a lot of them are looking to study on campus, so they rather wait to start for January start in order to start on campus. So they're looking for that university experience. That's really what makes the difference in the end. So they are looking. So these are some quite interesting uh, service I wanted to share with you. Um, now, I wanted to talk a little bit and continue on the conversation George was having and a few of you uh, talked about earlier. Look for students where they are. For me, that's very important. You know, we, yes, we are an online provider. There's not just us out there, of course. There's a lot of other providers out there. And there's your websites. There's your uh, social medias. There's a lot of activities you can do in-house. And uh, I think the most important thing is look for students where they are. They're online at the end. Students are online today. They've always been online. They just are online a lot more today than they used to be. But probably what has happened is that we've just, uh, things got a little fast. The, this pig up because of COVID. So what was going to happen in three years from now happened today because of COVID, because students were home. They can't interact with peers their own age by seeing each other. They need to do it online. So online student recruitment definitely has become uh, a, a lot more popular. A lot of um, universities or small universities that, were, that they've never done 
uh, online student recruitment started doing online student recruitment. And I think there are two aspects which I think are key to this. Now, the first one is brand your institution. It's very important to brand the institution and tell a story. It's not just about generating a lead. And I stress this with our clients, I stress this with partners, I say it to prospects, I say it to universities in general, you need to brand the institution before you even look for an inquiry. And that's a bit the difference from us and a portal. You know, a portal would not brand the institution. They don't care about that. They'll go out and generate leads. They bring you 3,000 leads a day, and then you have to go through them, manage them, trying to find the right student in there, and then engage with them. And it's a huge amount of work. But if a good branding is done before, we tell a good story about your institution, or you can tell a good story about your institution before generating a lead, before generating an inquiry, you've done basically 90% of the job. Because at that point, you're getting few leads, but the ones you're getting are highly qualified. They're ready to enroll, they're ready to apply, they're ready for a one-to-one -one interaction. So the branding part is key. And a lot of the times when I talk to university professionals, they're just asking me, how many leads can I expect? And I'm thinking, I can give you an estimate of leads, but what really matters is the work you're doing before generating the lead. So you need to educate your audience. That's something I always say, educate your audience about your institution, about your programs, about what you are doing and what you're offering them. Because in the end, students are clients. So this one is an example, and very briefly, I'm not going to, to explain you how it works, but it's our funnel. We do a variety of steps in order to engage with the students. So before the student talks to you, they've gone through so many steps, they've learned so much about you that if they're still interested, they can actually inquire and get in touch with you. If they're not, we lose them halfway through in the steps and that's fine because we don't want to generate inquiries that are not relevant for you. So that really is the key. Now, the second step is virtual events. I'm not, not going into virtual events. A lot of you have done a variety of virtual events and I want, don't want to bother you with something that you hear all the time, but I think there are three key virtual events. The first one is webinars. We've all been running webinars. We have run webinars for the past years. A lot of you have done webinars for five or even 10 years. Virtual, virtual open days. Virtual open days, I think, is the future of webinars, truthfully. I think webinars are turning into virtual open days. We might not want to call them open days because we still want to have the open day in person. That's okay. But is a big webinar at the end, a long webinar, a week of webinars, a month of webinars, a year of content on demand webinars. There's a lot of activities that can be done in terms of virtual open days. We have run over 30 virtual open days last year, and really they did show a lot are engaged. There's no fatigue for them. They're living on the computer. They live on their phone. They live on their tablet. I mean, they have their phone in their hands. I have it right here next to me, and, and I'm 34 years old, but I'm sure a student who's like 16, 17, or 18 probably has it glued to them even when they sleep. So it's not, there's no fatigue for them. It's fatigue for us, I think, because we're the one presenting all of these events, but the fatigue for the student, I haven't seen it at least. The other step is one-to-one -one sessions. One-to-one -one sessions for me, they are key. The one-to-one -one session allows you to actually engage with the students. You can't do it in person, but you can do it online. There's tools like Zoom, there's tools like Google Meet, Microsoft Teams. Try if you, I know it's a lot of work because you need to go out, you need to try to share a calendar invite, you need to try to book one-to-one -one sessions, but the one-to-one -one session is really what makes the difference at the end. If you can bring students on a one-to-one -one session rather than a big webinar with 100 people, they will actually share a lot more information with you because they're more shy. They're not going to talk about themselves in front of other 99 people, but they will do it on a one-to-one -one session. So here you'll see another survey which shows what kind of virtual events are students interested in. Fairs, yes, they are, not as much because I think we've all seen fairs, they go so-so, <laughs> they're not always great. Uh, webinars, they're used to it, so it's fantastic. And virtual open day, open day has been growing. And the beauty of virtual open days is about the international virtual open days. You would never attract international students from South America all the way to Europe for, a, for an open day. But you can do it with a virtual open day. And that's really what makes the difference. You can connect and engage and show to potential students across the world how your institution is. Campus tours, you know, you can use, for example, the tools that George mentioned earlier like the 360 street view of your institution. We have some clients who have done it. For example, NABA in Milano, the, the Academia di Belle Arti, they've done a Google street view of their campus. And it's fantastic because you can navigate through it as if you were on street view. And we all use street view. So imagine a student that can navigate through your school and pretend to be there. I think that's, that's a great tool. Now, the third step is WhatsApp messaging. Now, you can ask for the phone number of the student. On your website, I highly suggest you to do it. I know it's expensive to confirm the phone number, but you don't need to. You can probably just 
ask for the number and about 80% of the numbers probably are going to be correct and use those numbers. WhatsApp marketing is probably the next step. We do a lot of WhatsApp activities for us. We do it for confirming students for the webinars. We do it for confirming uh, uh, students when maybe they haven't responded to the client. So there's a lot of activities that can be done on WhatsApp and the response rate is through the roof. I mean, emails, how often do I open my Gmail in particular? Maybe once a week. A student, maybe a bit more than me, but how often do I open my WhatsApp? Every second. I mean, I have WhatsApp messages right now that just came in and I'm gonna check this probably when I'm done with this, with this event. So students is the same, they will check them, they will respond, they're so quick, it takes them a second. So WhatsApp and, or messaging in general, you know, iMessage or, or WeChat, there's a lot of WhatsApp sol or messaging solutions out there. Highly suggest to use those. Now to the most exciting part, which I know everyone hates, is selling. Now, I'm not gonna talk about selling, I'm not going to talk about selling your institution, because I think that's crucial. One thing I've learned by running a, a conference similar to this one in the US a few weeks ago is that the US is a very different model than Europe. They treat clients, they treat students as clients. They don't treat them as prospects. They don't treat them as partners. They're clients, they're paying for it. I mean, they're, you have to sell them your degree. There's tons of degrees out there. You're in a challenging environment as well, because there's thousands of you, there's millions of you out there you know, if I look at Doc City, there's probably four competitors out there, which I wouldn't even classify as competitors, just four or five. You have millions of institutions offering programs exactly like yours or very similar to yours to the eye of the students. So you need to sell that product. And the US model is a full on sales team. So the US model really works as a full on sales team. So they hire people to sell and they're there to actually generate uh, engagement with the students. And that's why it works. It's a little bit like when, if we have a shop, let's say I have a, a shoe store, right? Since I'm in Italy, shoe store fits well. I have a shoe store and someone comes in and they're just looking and I ask them, can I help you? And they're like, no, I'm just looking. Now that's when I need to try to sell them the product. That's the moment. And a lot of the leads that you're going to generate, people are just looking. Students are looking. They're not there to enroll. The leads we generate even, a lot of the leads we generate are not there to enroll yet. You need to sell them that degree because they're just looking. There's a difference between someone looking to buy and someone just looking. The one looking to buy comes in and says, I'm looking for this pair of shoes in this size. I want to buy that. I'm looking for a bachelor in international business in the UK. Do you offer it? Yes, I'm interested. I saw it on your website. That's someone looking to buy but someone just browsing, that's the one that we need to catch their attention. And that's about 90% of the leads we generate probably, we meaning all of us in general. So we need to actually sell them the product and that's the most important part. And just to wrap up this, the last part for me is don't give up after one attempt. I know it's a lot of work to contact students. And when I used to sell in my, previous in my first job, what I used to say to my prospects when I was talking to them, I was like, how many emails have I had to send you to be able to book a meeting with you? I'm sure it wasn't one. I'm sure if we have any clients logged into this meeting right now, I did not just send, or any of my team did not just send you one email to book a meeting. I think we sent you probably about 15 emails. We probably called you four to five times. We invited you to two or three events. That's what it takes. It goes for students they need to be contacted. And I know that a lot of time you don't have the team, you don't have the time, and it takes a lot of time. It does, it sure does. It takes a ton of time. But if you just get a small pool of students which are highly qualified and you focus on those and you reach out to them a couple of times, I think you will get more traction by doing that than emailing 10,000 people once every six months. So that's my take on this. I'll leave it to Adam now to continue the... Uh, event. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. A really, really interesting presentation. So I'll just share my screen very quickly. There we go. Great. And yes, Andrea, on that note, actually, it's very interesting. Uh, sometimes Andrea and I have done uh, marketing campaigns. We generate two or 300 leads. We send one email, very little response. But then if we send two emails, three emails, if we uh, send WhatsApp messages in particular, uh, we can end up having 20, 30 meetings uh, just from a different kind of outreach. 
so just to move on, now we have the rapid fire talks, um, followed by the question and answer session. Uh, we have a lot of questions in chat. So we're going to begin with Tanya from SOAS, University of London. Then we'll have Thomas from University West, then uh, David from the University of Gibraltar, and then Petter from the University of Petch. So Tanya, I think we can begin with you. Hey, thank you, Adam. Cheers. Um, if we had more time, I think it'd be interesting to talk about what we've tried that hasn't worked, because I think there's a lot of what we've tried so many things following lockdown. I think everyone threw lots of things at it to see what would work. Uh, the one thing that we found that really has landed very well with our applicants and inquirers are the taster sessions or master classes, however you want to call it. And these are 20 minute mini lectures that are taken from actual modules that we deliver as part of our programs. And we've created a week long series of these taster sessions and they're each an hour long. And when students register for them, they get a confirmation back. And the confirmation has included suggested articles to read ahead of the taster session. And then during the session, the academic, as they're delivering this mini lecture, they open up Q and A and polls and questions to try to get engagement from the students. And then when we send the recording after the event, there are suggested further readings. So the idea, and I think the reason this has gone down so well with students, what students don't want in a virtual event is information they can find on the website. They're not interested in that, they can look for that themselves. So this idea of, of there was a lot of anxiety over the last year of what would online learning be like? And so we did our best to emulate that in a, a real world environment. This is what a lecture will be like online. In fact, this is part of an actual lecture that we teach with the actual program convener delivering the session. So, and, and I think making the topics really engaging. So some of the topics were things like gender and decolonizing the body. And other lectures were things like, do humanitarian organizations do more harm than good when they respond to a crisis? So the topics themselves looked very interesting and we opened it up for the whole week that they could register for as many topics as they wanted. So I would say that, that because it's been engaging, because it emulated actual online learning, and because it was then recorded and circulated afterwards, those three things have been incredibly successful. And it's given us a bit of a bank for content marketing. So we've got all of these recorded sessions that we've now been able to use in our email nurture tracks, and we'll be able to put it up on website program pages. Okay. So in a nutshell, that's what has worked. If anyone wants to ask me what hasn't worked, I'm happy to tell you more details on that. Cheers, Sonia. Appreciate that. So next up, we have Thomas from University West. Yes, University of West Sweden. I need that. <laughs> uh, yeah, for one year ago, uh, the whole pandemic situation started up. Uh, we were not so prepared. And... Uh, one uh, good institution, Swedish Institute, our national agency uh, in here in Sweden, they coordinated a lot of good things with webinars and uh, digital fairs with almost all Swedish universities. But uh, it was successful events. But for us as a smaller university, uh, University West, not so many knows about us. And at the fair, maybe Many students would like to talk to Lund, Uppsala, Stockholm, and these more famous uh, brands. <laughs> so then we decided and talked a lot internal during the summer before the campaign started up for uh, recruitment 2021, what to do. So we did, uh, I can say, three things. First of all, we did a home makeover of our program presentations, signed up with more web portals because they uh, get traffic into our um, program pages. The second thing was to develop a bit more uh, collaboration with our agents, a bit, bit more digital presentations together with agents all around the world because they know what is good in their areas. So invested in digital campaigns and webinars with agents. And the third thing was that we uh, identified some companies that could de deliver the whole package for us. We just decide about the price, about the day, and then when the day comes, we just log in and use the company's platform and attract and sell our programs because the audience was there. I can mention maybe if you're kind, one of these uh, companies that works really good and it's Doc City that delivers it in a, in a really good way. 
and we will continue with that. And you have some other companies as well. And these things have made that we have increased over 25% in applicants this year. So uh, I think we are in the right way for us as a smaller university. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Everyone's on time. I, I, I love it. <laughs> so next up, we have David from the University of Gibraltar. Hi everyone. Um, hi, thank you for letting me uh, to invite my inviting me to speak, and hello to everyone who's in the chat as well. I'm going to uh, share with you some slides. Firstly, I think when uh, people hear about the University of Gibraltar, one of the first things they ask is like, "Where are you?" <laughs> so I thought for the for the purpose of this, it's always good to give us context. Uh, when we talk about small, we really mean small. Uh, we've got about 400 students. Uh, we are located at the very southernmost tip of, uh, of Europe. We were established in 2015. Uh, and pretty much what we offer is UK uh, academic standards, that UK brand of education, but in a European warm, um, friendly and, and kind of um, safe multicultural community. Uh, we are, one of our strengths has always been on-campus in-person teaching and a very personal experience. So you can imagine what happened when last year in March, <laughs> we had to shift pretty much overnight uh, due to COVID to fully digital student recruitment strategy. It meant that we were no longer able to deliver on, in campus. Uh, we went to digital teaching and learning for a while. Our face-to-face -face fairs and open days had to shift to virtual events, which uh, as a relatively new institution were, were relatively new to us. Um, we found our international recruitment stalled pretty much overnight. And I think this felt across the sector for a temporary basis uh, last year. Our size though has always been one of our strengths. And I think last year really showed us this. It allowed us to react quickly and effectively uh, implement a revised strategy. We changed our funnel very much from digital marketing, using third-party portals, different, uh, you know, our own website, and and lots of new innovation, innovative techniques to digital market, but drove everyone uh, towards webinars. Then that passed on to our inquiries team, and and hopefully drove to an application. Again, this was kind of happened pretty much overnight. And 2020, what did teach us to do was uh, to innovate. So we tried, as I mentioned before, digital marketing. We were looking at retargeting, programmatic uh, advertising, things that were techniques that we weren't necessarily doing so before. We identified new markets where we found that some of our f uh, markets like India had kind of really frozen and stalled. We had to look towards uh, markets that were closer to us. We looked over the, the Straits of Gibraltar to Morocco. We looked regionally and we looked closer to home. We found that our local students and regional students who traditionally may want to go abroad to study were much more comfortable and that fear of going abroad was, was stayed with us. Um, but what we did find is that we found people signing up to our online events, but we did find a huge drop off in attendees. So sometimes we'd get 30, 40, 50 people sign up to a webinar, but maybe we were, we were there speaking to five or six students. We realized that the problem was in part us, but also in part due to time zones and about poor internet connection. So we started to implement a pre and post event commerce plan. And that's sometimes we, we, we were already working with uh, systems like WhatsApp. Uh, our, our USP and our, 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 our culture and ethos is all about a personal approach. So we pretty much uh, keep those one-to-one -one contacts with students wherever we can. And we designed a, an email nurture path just to keep people engaged. We understood that if they couldn't make one event, it doesn't mean that they weren't interested, but we gave them opportunities to keep engaged with us. And we, so last year was a year of learning and this year is, is also a year of learning, but we've become much better at what we kind of do. Um, for, for us, the best practice that we'd like, like to share would be that it's always about offering inquiries a choice of how to connect with you. And I mean that by saying, uh, give them an option to book a Calendly one-to-one -one session. Can they watch a virtual uh, webinar again? Um, 
also I'd say host your own events, but of course, will you drive a lot of traffic to one event on your website where maybe it's best of partnering with someone like Doc City or um, attending virtual events uh, or larger virtual events. Um, the connection between prospective students and existing students is a very, very important part of a virtual event or a webinar. So that's kind of that buddy idea and that peer to peer uh, connection and the creation of quality content to support the webinar. So we're not in the place in, at the moment where we can offer a fully immersive uh, virtual tour, but we did create a virtual a video tour of our site. We did cre uh, create smaller um, uh, student profiles where they were talking almost one-to-one -one with students as well. And lastly, was just keep communication uh, clear and uh, regular with students. So yeah, so thank you. Uh, that was us in a nutshell and stay safe. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, David. Really, really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, so next we have uh, Peter from the University of Petch. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I think you can hear me and see me well. Um, so yeah, I, I think I just, I just continue where uh, David stopped with, uh, with, with getting as personal as possible. I think that was the, that was the key uh, for us uh, last year. And um, the other thing that we did, we, which came out quite successful, uh, is uh, the student involvement in uh, student recruitment. Uh, we have a program that we've been running for a couple of years now called International Student Ambassadors. I think uh, many of you have uh, quite similar programs. And um, in these programs, uh, what we did last year is uh, we just sent uh, more and more uh, student ambassadors to online fairs uh, and recruitment events and host webinars uh, as representatives of the University of Page. Uh, the big upside of it is just uh, basically two things. One is that, of course, uh, learning uh, the student experience from a student is always more honest than, uh, than I can be. Uh, and also uh, the other thing, which, which was a, a really great tool that uh, in many cases, they hold their sessions uh, in their native language uh, and their mother tongue. So, and, and I think it, it really gave us uh, an upper hand in, in situations where, you know, uh, all of the representatives at a certain fair was uh, speaking only English, but our guy was speaking uh, the native language, the mother tongue of the people there. And in some cases, it's really, really important uh, when uh, when parents can can you know interact with with our uh, student, with our uh, representative there. And you know, it, it gave us a, a huge advantage there. Uh, and we just want to you know build on it more and more uh, with two initiatives. One is uh, again launching a more powerful uh, communication tool through uh, WhatsApp, and again give it to the students. To, to call the the uh, uh, the prospective applicants uh, and also to develop this into some kind of a member get member program where students can get a certain uh, tuition fee deduction uh, when they you know uh, uh, help uh, applicants through the application process so this is the the basic way where we are thinking that that helped us last year and we'd like to uh, build on it even more in the coming years thank you for having me again yeah thank you i really appreciate that um very on time as well <laughs> um which is always a good thing so next up folks we have adonis uh, who is founder and president of zurich elite business school um, he has a very interesting presentation to give um, about the changing of hiring requirements of US tech giants and how this means new opportunities and threats um, and different impacts for universities and global education providers. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you also, Doc City, for inviting me as a host. And thanks also to the audience for the patience. It's always a challenge if you are the last one, how to try to. to, to keep it uh, exciting um i hope so much i will manage to do that uh, let me please share my screen to have an idea about uh, what we are going uh, to talk about So, 
I hope you all can see. So um, uh, due to the time that we're a little bit delayed, just one sentence about Zurich Elite Business School. We are a management boutique, so a small business school um, uh, in the center of Zurich. And um, our USP um, has been actually, so in the last 17 years, um, that we have been the first business school in history uh, developed um, job-based um, skills development modules. So on the job, we left the physical facilities of the business school. We entered uh, corporations and the industry and we, and we developed these uh, job-related skills uh, development modules. So what I'm going to, to talk about, you, uh, Adam, already said um, um, the, the, the uh, important change of hiring requirements that started taking place um, in um, 2018, 2019, um, and which is combined with a huge disruption in global education. Mm -hmm. Actually, one, um, one of the um, three big dis uh, disruptions that have been taking place in the last decade. Um, so, of course, by looking on the last year, um, the last perhaps 15, 15 months, we all uh, had to face uh, the uh, COVID challenges, um, which were combined, of course, with the digitization and digitalization. I like to differentiate many schools that didn't have any online um, um, business. Uh, they had to start with their digitization and many schools that ha have already done this in the past, uh, they proceeded with their digitalization. This is important, all of us know about it, and again, the challenges, but I would like today to talk with you about uh, the time before, so some years before uh, the COVID time. So, and I would like to move on with a question to you. What do you think actually has global education uh, common with iTunes? I'll start uh, perhaps with some information about uh, the trends and uh, of, uh, of the last 10 years, and you have time to think about this question. So global education and iTunes. So perhaps we we'll start with, with a study from INSEAD, Harvard Business School and IMD 2011 about future of business education. And this study found out that uh, the business programs have to have a higher practical orientation, um, higher personalization, and MBA programs should take uh, the business environment of students into account. One year later in Barcelona, an important uh, um, Congress uh, took place and the results among the world leading business school were exactly the same. So what did happen in uh, 2019, we got, so to say, first warning from the US industry they announced um, major US employers that uh, they started hiring candidates who don't have the traditional academic degrees looking primarily um, for job related skill sets, the so called real world skills, and not just theoretical knowledge. They also said that they would uh, treat these career certificates equal to full degrees, very interesting, and that they believe that online credentials are of generally equal quality to those completed in person. So what happened next? Google uh, entered the game uh, and their senior vice president of global affairs, he blocked, many of you know knows that, I'm, I'm sure about that, uh, he blocked that uh, Google needs new accessible job training solutions from enhanced vocational programs to online education to help America recover and rebuild. This is a strong message because it comes from Google and of course uh, from a top manager. He also said that in their own hirings, they will now treat these new career certificates, which are between uh, one, three to six months as the equivalent of a four year degree for related roles. Another very strong message. So um, coming back to the question, uh, the similarities of global education, the iTunes disruption, perhaps for the younger ones, uh, please allow me to 
uh, show you how the music industry was working 40 years ago when uh, we wanted to buy a record um, uh, or to hear a song, we actually had to go and buy the entire record um, to go to the music to the music shop and buy this record. So what did then happen? What, did, what was um, uh, granted to Steve Jobs? Uh, he created the iTunes and which was actually the innovation um, and the disruption both of, of the iTunes. That for the very first time, if I wanted to hear a song, I didn't have to buy the entire record. I could buy just a single song or perhaps two songs. And this has been actually a huge disruption for the market and changed the entire music industry. Now, the similarity to global education, um, how used the education industry um, work in, uh, let's say, until 2012, 20, 2013. So we have the end consumers, which of course we call the students, and they used to go to university uh, to attend an, a degree, a bachelor degree, an MBA degree, and they had actually to purchase um, the degree, um, meaning that the unit of sale, as it was in the music industry, the entire record in our industry, the unit of sale has been actually the, de the degree. And then, of course, we had these very smart guys coming from the US, the MOOC platforms like Coursera, and they came and changed the game. Similar to the iTunes, what did the guys do? Uh, they gathered single courses on these uh, platforms and gave for the very first time the opportunity to students to buy single courses. And as if it wasn't enough for us educationists, uh, then we had uh, some other very interesting and not to underestimate big companies like uh, Google and IBM. And they also came and started uh, offering courses, single courses on these platforms. So uh, when the student or students started not to buy uh, the degrees, but they started uh, to buy single courses. At the beginning, it was free of charge. Of course, it's the common way to gather huge amount of students and you, uh, or to, to develop a good user base, so to say. But over the time, uh, they started charging for the courses. Um, and it changed the game totally in education. It has been changing. It's um, um, the, 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 the current status and it will be also in the future. And um, if you ask yourself, okay, is it actually um, an important disruption in our industry? Um, I will give you an, a current number that uh, by now we are talking, uh, the major, not all of them, just the major platforms, they have 100 million learners. So Coursera, uh, Udemy, EDX, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, why did this happen? This is a question that um, um, you could think of. Um, all of us, we knew the, the main criticism of higher education is that we actually don't always properly uh, equip students with the real world skills. Actually, they need the, the real skills they need in the workplace. And of course, they leave them in debt for many years, especially in the US, and they, they struggle to pay back the loans. So, which are actually the, the advantages that are driving this uh, disruption in the last years and actually have revolutionized our, our business. Um, courses, the single courses, or if um, they are stuck together in degrees, um, um, so the cert in certificate, excuse me. So they are state of the art and updated. Why? Because 
uh, just think of um, artificial intelligence and a, a, a blockchain. And where did, do actually all these changes take place within universities? Actually, no, they take place within the, the big guys. Um, very often in the US, especially in these areas I'm talking, US and China. So actually these big guys um, are first aware of these changes. So they are much faster than uh, universities and business schools like, like, like we are. They are job related. They teach actually exactly the skills that um, they uh, uh, know uh, from, from first hand that the students need in future uh, job profiles. The pricing costs a fraction of a traditional university degree. So just think of, uh, uh, to give you an example, um, a, a Google course, a, a, it costs about $50, $40 in an average. Um, over six months, it's about $300. So much actually you pay just for the books in one semester in a, in a master degree. Flexible scheduling, they can combine much easier with work and family. And of course, the stackability. You can start with a course, continue with a second one, a third course, and um, you can um, all these then uh, put together uh, often in, in some degrees or in, in, in certificates. So which uh, the, the, the motivation from the students, again, what makes, I just wanted to talk uh, with facts and also with numbers that you will see it the last uh, pages. I'll, again, I'll try to keep it very short. Um, the, the motivation of the students is firstly the higher employability. And we know all of us how important employability. Meanwhile, it has been always important, but meanwhile, it, it, it got a huge importance, especially for students if they are paying this high amount of, 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 of dollars for the degrees and of course the salaries very often so uh, these certificates lead to uh, higher um, uh, salaries the companies of course as we said before they have a skill set in mind so they get the right skill set from the candidate for a particular job uh, just think again of this uh, uh, chart and another change that is happening and is actually also revolu revolutionizing our business is that until now, the uh, uh, companies had to go via the universities to educate the students and very often or, uh, also to employ the students, to recruit the students. But what are they doing actually now and they will do for the future? That's the only, uh, uh, that's really sure. They're going directly to the students. Many of them, they will not go in, in this intensity or perhaps anymore, if you project after five or 10 years, they will not go anymore through the university or to a much, much uh, lower uh, extent. So coming to uh, almost to an end, is it just a trend? or uh, that will pass away, also when COVID will pass away. Again, to remind you, it started before COVID, started actually um, seven to eight years before COVID. So um, a well-known survey of the Northeastern University showed that 750 HR leaders at leading US employers. I repeat, because I think the number is not uh, low, 700, uh, 50 human resource leaders. They said that they undertake efforts to de-emphasize degrees and prioritize skills. Two thirds of them also believe that online credentials are of a equal quality to those completed in person. Not only Google, also Apple, IBM, Starbucks. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, very strong brands we are talking here about no longer require candidates to have a four-year degree. Big um, accountancy firms like Ernst & Young and P uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers have abandoned policies of requiring certain academic scores or degrees 
in their hiring processes. And perhaps the last uh, study from a person in 2019 um, that um, included 11,000 learners in 19 countries, and it found that among the employed uh, respondents, uh, most of them have attended courses provided by employers or professional associations rather than colleges or universities. So to finalize with an example about Google, these Google career courses and certificates on Coursera. And again, I don't want to talk whether it's the right direction of global education, um, ethical issues, et cetera. Uh, my intention in this presentation has been just to show you the evolution, what's the trends, what's happening in, in our uh, industry and how it changed our, our life, our academic, um, academic um, uh, proceedings and the way that perhaps we should approach in the future. So Google has already developed 32 courses on Coursera. They have strong number again, over a million of attendees um, on Coursera. And um, it's important to mention that it has been within two and a half to three years. Within two and a half and three years, the Google guys managed to get over one million of students. I see the number and start not feeling very well. Uh, if I look on our on the number of our students at Zurich Elite Business School. So it means almost 400,000 students per year. So the main question for me that arises, so very simple question is, in 10 years, they will have 4 million students per year, 10 million students per year. What will be actually the, the, the evolution? There are many, again, we are, I don't want to uh, uh, break the time frame. Uh, we are delayed. So um, I would like normally to talk a little bit about how to tackle these challenges. We have success stories also at Zurich Elite Business School. We have developed several models that uh, are proven to be very successful in the recent past. But you have here my, my, my contact numbers and my email address and you are very, very uh, welcome uh, to, to contact me if you have further questions. Thanks again for your time and for your patience. Back to you, Adam and Andrea. Yeah. How are universities supporting international students through the online studies change? And how are universities using alumni, international students experience to increase international student enrollment? I think it's a really good question. I mean, I can answer a part of it. I'm not a university, so I can't answer for universities. But one thing I can say about alumni is definitely that it's uh, it's basically like having uh, someone who can help you push the courses that you're looking to promote. Because at the end, they've done it. They've studied it. And maybe you haven't studied in your own institution, the one you're working in, but they have. So they know exactly what their experience was. One thing we always do is bring at all of our virtual events an alumni and a current student. I think we have all heard that, so I'm not going back and repeat myself on that, but I think those are really big selling point, more than bringing a professors. Truthfully, I always try to leave professors out because I tend to talk about the syllabus and the students are not interested in that. They want to hear about how is it to study at the institution, how's life at the institution. So I think that's, uh, um, that's definitely something that I would suggest. So from my side, I can give that, that advice at least. So I don't know if any of you wants to add on that. I'd, I'd venture a, a brief thing from, uh, again, from digital tooling perspective, um, uh, you know, uh, alumni is uh, still a very underdeveloped, uh, um, uh, alumni engagement especially is underdeveloped in, in, in many parts uh, of uh, Europe and Asia today. If the United States, Canada, and the UK, I think, are at the forefront of use, utilizing alumni for recruitment as well as for development and uh, advancement purposes, which means money for the university, um, one tool that's very easy for anybody who does recruitment, um, and I, I probably some of you know it already, is just LinkedIn. Have you tried to use LinkedIn to see how many alumni you have from your university on LinkedIn? 
I mean, it's really simple. You just go there and anybody who has listed your university as their uh, school uh, will show up. And not only that, but you will get something that you get downloaded as a CV as an Excel file. Uh, and and you are able then to see their location, their current location. So whenever you have an event or uh, something in Malaysia, in Kuala, in Kuala Lumpur, in, in Indonesia, wherever it is, you can ask those people if they're willing to join you in that virtual fair, if they're willing to join you in that webinar. It's a very easy tool that doesn't cost you money. It's, it's accessible to you and anyone else because this is public information that all of them put there. Uh, give it a try once when you when you do the filters. When you go to LinkedIn and say list, uh, type in your school, and it will give you different tabs at the top there, and it will be like under education. If you look there, you will see all this uh, all this alumni. In case you didn't know that, give it a try, and you'll be surprised. I'm always uh, surprised when I look for different universities. So, great. And um, what developments um, have happened in digital marketing strategy, and what lessons have been learned in the past twelve months? Should I, should I take a stab at it? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we, I think in between myself and my colleagues in the panel and Donis and everyone would be like, we can talk for half a day about this. But I think it's changed tremendously. I mean, do you guys remember, I used to be a recruiter, right? I used to be on the, on the ground uh, in buses and trains and, you know, uh, uh, road warrior and so on. And do you remember when the... The, the, the online piece was kind of like an added on thing. You were doing it, but oh, well, you know, it was the important part was for you to be in the fair and it was for you to be in a uh, face-to-face with the scene. And it still stays there. It, it will be there. The problem and the question will then be, um, you know, is it safe to travel? Number one. Number two, uh, is it, is it uh, um, um, you know, financially uh, does it make sense? Um, so um, I think that what we've seen in the in the past year is a tremendous reliance on digital tools for recruitment. Um, and we've seen, I mean, I survey uh, websites, for instance, and I audit websites. I've been doing it for a long time. The implosion of good websites for universities over the past year is tremendous because people finally started reaching out to professionals to kind of like giving up on that. We can do it all in-house and it's all going to be good. Um, because you know what? Your in-house team is not going to know all the things that happen in the market at that one point. So there's been a lot of that, a lot more openness in the ability to create a full-fledged digital uh, student recruitment portfolio. And that's good. That's a good thing. Um, like I said in my presentation, VR, um, uh, AR, um, uh, all the tools that give the students a taste. Um, uh, Andrea mentioned this as well uh, in his presentation when he talked about um, about the 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 the, the one on ones and the webinars that are now happening digitally. You don't want to, however, give up on that personalized approach. Um, remember, we're talking Gen Z students. They want to be catered to they like to be catered to, they want to be pampered in a way because they do look as them, at themselves as first and foremost, people who would come to your university, will select your university out of 22,000 universities or whatever in the whole world, they will choose you for a lifetime, a life-changing experience. So um, I think digital recruiting is here, is here to stay. Um, it will move forward in different ways and um, uh, the development has been, has been extraordinary. And I think I would like to add something to the very valuable input of, of George, um, that um, all of us have developed, uh, whether we want it or not, a certain a, a base of digital marketing, digital recruitment strategies. And again, we went through this, some of us digitization or digitalization process. If, um, and uh, from our experience, and. Uh, being also a strategy consulting also in the industry, I know very well but that all is fine. And of course, um, meanwhile, it's a prerequisite to be successful. Um, but if you really want to be successful, um, you, you have to look on your strengths and your weaknesses, of course, and try to develop your own USPs. What is that? that will in the student journey 
differentiate yourself from your competition. And of course, uh, if I can put it this way, it starts also for, uh, with your USPs with regards to your programs and your, to your curriculum and to, to your degrees. This is the source that can be transferred to your recruiters and then to the students. Um, what I see happening is that, again, uh, including also our business school, um, we are applying several tools and also a, a, a acquiring new partners that help us recruit the students. Uh, but very often, if I reflect, I'm seeing that uh, to 90%, we do almost the same things. So this is very important for all educators. Every one of you have uh, its own, uh, your own strengths. Uh, look on the strengths, um, uh, develop your USPs. There are several of them. Some of them, again, I try to cover just one area of uh, a current disruption. We have another two uh, huge disruptions. So altogether three, and there is so much potential for every university and school to develop, uh, um, to develop, let's say, um, sometimes also a niche strategy um, or, or a general like USP. Brilliant. So thank you, Adonis. And I think the next question I can take, there's quite a few. After coronavirus restrictions end, do you think um, the, uh, the growth we see in online degrees, online study will continue? And to what extent? Yes, I think the growth will stay there. I think they will continue. There will continue to be growth. I mean, I think Adonis's numbers were just like spot on. Yeah, it, it, it's happening, and I don't think it's going away. This is an opportunity for students to actually engage with universities that otherwise would have been completely inaccessible to them. I will go back to to my idea as well. What I think will happen, there will be a transformation over the next 10, 15 years of universities in general. We will see two categories of universities worldwide. We will see the content generating universities, those that are going to be online and face to face. And there will be then maybe degree packaging universities, universities that will have to sort of accept transfer credits and bring them in and sort of package all that. Actually, when I look uh, with my clients at, at, at strategic approaches to higher education, this is what I put in their mind. You have to be flexible about how you transfer credits internationally and how what you accept in terms of like packaging a degree. So that's one thing. The other thing that will, will most probably happen over the next uh, 10 years is that there will be a lot more uh, hybrid um, uh, degrees out there floating out there. Um, there will be fully online universities, but there will also be blended universities. The, 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 the good part about this is that a lot more students will have access to it. The bad part is that it may lead, and I'm saying this with a lot of caution, but it may lead to a widening of the gap between those students who are able to go face-to-face, -face, who are able to go on a campus because it's gonna be extremely expensive, right? and the students who stay online. The value of the degree online, however, as again, we went back like to, to, to we go back to, to Google, we go back to, uh, to Apple, to Cuban, to all these huge um, entrepreneurs, Tesla, who are saying like, uh, like Adonis uh, pointed out, they're saying, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to look for that. Is there a difference? Is there gonna be a difference between something that Google offers for three to six months and a full degree? Yeah, there will be a difference because that kind of locks you in. You take a six month degree, you just work for Google in that particular area. You take a four year degree. So there'll be differences. Things will settle. It will take a while, but the, the number of degrees online will, will increase. The number of hybrid opportunities will increase. The number of flexibility, certifications, micro-credentialing coming into packaging a full degree will increase. This is gonna be our hybrid time. This is what I believe will happen over the next decade, at least in my mind. Absolutely, thanks. Thanks, George. And perhaps to give you another number. So before COVID, the um, uh, penetration of dig digitization in our industry has been about two to 3%. At the peak of the crisis, um, it has been actually about 90%. So let's assume uh, we will have um, um, a, a slight step back after, um, after the crisis. It will be about 70%, 80%, 60%. But just uh, 
think of the two and three percent before and the 90 percent that we had now uh, at the peak of the crisis and uh it's enough the, the, i think a strong column on this development um of online uh credentials um either micro credentials or online degrees um e are these big uh, us tech guys so uh, google and ibm they started offering uh, uh these degrees they will continue offering them i think i'm not a prophet but by now google has as i said 32 certificates in five years from now they will have 100 certificates 150 certificates they will not make a step back because they see it's a multi-billion industry the guys know what they do and um we will have the change i think they will get a huge piece of of the pie uh, uh, and um, it will be a, a decision uh, for us a strategic decision for for the educationist are we going to keep on the way that we used to do business until now in the curriculum we continue doing the same but now we change on a digital uh, path and this will be actually um, our evolution or are we going as George said um, very correctly from my also point of view uh, try to offer either hybrid models or at least to enter this huge market uh, that is there and will be there and will be also will play a very important role in the future.